You know how you sometimes you just want a fireplace. It, it's getting cooler out. You want that apres ski feeling, make you feel like you own the chalet, the whole thing. But you might be an apartment dweller, and so it would be completely wrong to be lighting that fire, digging that fire pit right in your parquet floor there. So what I'm going to show you how to do is build this cool little thing. You have to tune up your lumber. Uh, it's just a sort of dominant submission thing. Now it knows who's boss, you see. So this is what we're aiming for. It's a miniature fireplace for apartment dwellers. So I'm going to build this again, only differently, because my ideas are bigger and stronger now. I want it to look even more like a fireplace. It should be actually wider than this. So here's the deal. The first thing you have to do is select your lumber, which of course I already have. I'm picking that really rustic board this beautiful weathered old barn board. You see? It's gorgeous. And the nice thing about barn board is that it's got all these character lines in it. See, like knots and holes. And So here's the thing. There's a lot of ways to cut a board. The simplest way is, is to have a big electric chop saw, which is noisy, but it smokes, OK? We don't have one of those. We could use a miter box, which probably you have in your basement. It might be just like an old hacked up one. Usually they're a bit smaller. And you use that with a back saw. Or you can use a big honkin' Swedish one like this. Gorgeous tool. Got to have one, except they're $200. But if you're into this, you might want to keep your eye on one, one of these when they go on sale. But to make it even simpler, we're just going to use the simple and humble speed square. Okay? What you do is you lay it on the wood like this, draw the line, and then simply cut it with a saw. Now, the joints aren't always perfect, but we'll get to that because, you know, perfection isn't necessarily our goal. So I'll take my pencil, and when you, if you're using an old piece of barn board, make sure you line it up so that you can use the knots because that's what gives it character. So I'll sort of make it about there. OK, and the pencil broke, so always have a spare. Huh? That's why they make carpenter's pencils with, with this really thick lead, because that happens. Right, so it's like that. Ooh, that sounds, that sounds good. OK, and then I'm going to select this saw. And you know what this is? This is a Japanese saw. And I love them, because they cut on the pull stroke rather than the push stroke, which is cool, because you know when you push a blade, it always wants to do this. So it's very frustrating to get it started. But here, you actually just lay it on the wood. And you let it push a little bit just to start, because that's not the cutting part, OK? But when I draw it back, then it cuts, OK? Then it really bites into the wood. So you can get a really nice, easy um, cut going. Also, the, the obligatory hair toss is good because it gives you an attitude. Hmm? When you get near the end and it starts to flop a bit, you know you're getting really close, so it's time to pretend you're pulling Excalibur from the stone. It gives you a nice clean uh, finish. Huh? OK. So that's the first cut. So I'm going to measure across six inches. You can use any dimensions you darn like. But I'm going for six inches across and four inches down, and that's going to give me that fireplace sort of a shape. OK, so I'm going to take this speed square, and once again, <laughs> mark the spot. OK, and it's going to go up to there. Oh, it's going to be gorgeous. Learning to use tools can be challenging. This is why it's good to work alone, especially if you talk out loud, or sometimes out very loud using expressive language. Keep that kind of talk between you and your carpentry. That's the origin of the word carping. Close enough. OK, learn that phrase. OK, it's really important and handy too, close enough.
It just means that there's room for improvement and you know, you want to be able to improve in life, otherwise you'd be ready to die and we're not ready yet, so close enough. All right, so now we glue. Now the drama builds, okay, because part of the drama is using a frame clamp. It's one of these, they're really uncooperative. So what you do is you glue the joints first and then you smack this frame clamp on it. Now, the glue, take off your $24 glove, okay, because glue tends to mess with the glove. And the glue you want to use is carpenter's glue. It's a yellow glue. It's just like Elmer's white glue or whatever that white glue that you grew up with in school. But it's yellow, and that just means it's better, stronger. Okay, so I'm going to have to just slide the frame clamp out of the way. I'm going to glue both sides of the joints, all four of them. So that's eight gluing surfaces. Then I'm going to smack it together and clamp it. It, it really is dramatic, <laughs> okay? St stay, stay, with, stay with, even if you don't really believe that it's going to be dramatic. So a thin bead like that and another thin bead or thick, really, because that's the beauty of it. If there's excess, that's just the way you like it. Mmm. Okay. Now, if you're a bit of a goof like me, you actually use your bare naked finger. It's a, an interesting sensual sensation and it's messy. Um, but you can use, uh, if you want, you can wear latex gloves unless you've got really sweaty hands, in which case you know already by now because you know yourself well that that's not pleasant. You just end up bathing in your own juices. All right, so you have a few minutes to get the glue, the uh, gluey pieces together. But you don't want to dawdle. This is not the time to take that phone call. So we'll push them together like this. And then, see, they don't look like it's ever going to work, but it will. Now, if you have a pocket, this is the ideal time to just use the inside of it to wipe off the extra glue. But if you don't have one of that, that's why I wear the older socks. It's just a little crusty surprise for whoever does the laundry at your house, right? All right, and now the frame clamp. These things are great. Cost you about 30 bucks, but if you're going to build a few of these for, say, Christmas presents, it's worth having them. Okay, and you tighten it up and then uh, there are these little speed nuts and they just slide on like this and as soon as they hit a, a surface, you can tighten them up. With the, they start threading, they're cool. Okay, so you gotta slide them all on and then tighten them up all at once. And then, then we're, we're gonna quickly and quietly leave the room while this sets up. Okay, so the frame is setting up, but I don't want to disturb it yet, so I'm going to move on to the next step, which is cutting the copper foil that goes to make the beautiful, warm background. Um, I, I got this nice heavyweight copper foil and um, banged it up with a ball-peen hammer that looks like this. Uh, you don't have to do that, but it's kind of fun. Um, you can get various densities of this stuff. Some of it's really lightweight, and it's okay to use that. Um, but I like this heavier stuff because you can really uh, bang it around and have some fun with it. Um, and the, the way to work with it is you cut it with tin snips. And tin snips come in, um, they either cut to the left or to the right. So depending on if you're left-handed or right-handed, one of them will feel easier. So um, to, to figure out how much material you need, it's a good idea to just lay it across the back of your frame and just sort of bend it around and then get a rough mark for how long it needs to be. In this case, it's about that. And you want a bit of excess because you're going to have to screw it down. So you just go ahead and cut it. And it's easier usually to flip it when you get halfway across so you're not fighting the sharp edge of the metal. There we go. And now's the time to put it across, if you want to bang on it, you put it across um, a log for some texture and whap on it with a hammer or you um, tape two soda cans together and with hockey tape and then wrap this thing to, to make nice cur a nice curve in it. 
like this. You can see that I'm clearly not the post-industrial, slick kind of designer type person because I've already banged up the copper and it looks pretty shabby. But this would work. Then you have to have some um, slightly heavier weight copper to cut, a I'll show you, to cut this little disc that the candle sits on is cut from heavier weight uh, copper. So you take a sheet of heavyweight copper, thank you, and cut a little square first, and then you can work much easier with a small square than you can trying to cut a circle out of a giant piece of copper. And you know, frankly, if your tin snips are old or if you don't even have any, this can be really frustrating. <laughs> I suppose especially if you don't have any. So usually people's tin snips are rusty and wrecked. Okay, so having done that, I'm just going to freehand it. Um, and I'm going to leave a little tab so that I can push it through the backing. That's what that little thing is that I'm making right now. And I'm going to cut away the excess, like so. And then just make a circle. Or heck, it doesn't have to be a circle. Who's ever going to see it, really? It's hidden. It could be in the shape of a tombstone or a it doesn't really matter as long as it'll hold a tea light. See, this isn't so bad. Okay, wait. See, I'm giving it sort of a fish shape, really. <laughs> when you're young, you're always getting a new tooth or underarm hair or hips, and it makes you excited and expectant. And when all that stops, you get sort of complacent. But when you're learning, unexpected things start happening again. So that's why trying something new gives you back your youth. OK. Now I'm going to take my lovely piece of copper that I cut right here. And using a utility knife, I'm just going to punch a little slit in it. And through that slit, actually, I'm going to cut two. Um, and in terms of how high, if you want your candle to disappear and you just see the glimmer, then cut it lower so that you can place it on the back of your frame and, and achieve whichever effect you like. And this is probably a good time to use your tape measure. 13 and a half inches, so I'll center it. Calcul calculating rapidly as I am to six and a half, six and a bit, six and a half and a bit. Right about there. So I'll just make a little thin slice. And then another one right below it so I can fold the tab through two of them. OK. And then I'll take my goofy looking little plate, which nobody's ever going to see, which so we don't care that it's goofy looking. And I'll feed it through the top one. Through it goes, then over. And this this will be a bit of a fight, but I will get it, OK? I just have to get it back through the front again. There it goes. OK, so see it's curling back up again. So I'll just bend it down and then level it off. And there we have it. OK, now I've made the whole inside of my copper all gritty with my sweaty fingertips. So probably just take a rag to that and polish those off real quick. Or at least smear them around a little. OK, now I'm going to go check on the frame and we're going to apply this baby to the back of it. Oops. When you're building new skills, you feel daunted because there's so much to learn. But when you get good at it, you realize there's even more to learn because your ambition has grown. You want to try things you didn't even know existed when you first started. And if that doesn't remind you of being a teenager, I don't know what will. Beautiful. OK, this is a time to self-congratulatory, be self-congratulatory, because it's come out 
It's holding together. Nothing's gone badly wrong. Okay, so I'm just going to kink this on both sides so that I have um, and then suck it up a little bit like this. Check that it's centered. Now, you want to adjust the height of it by sliding the metal according to where you want, if you want the candle to show or not. I want mine to be invisible, so I'm putting it low. So right about there is good. It's kind of like lining up a golf shot, isn't it? <laughs> Only in this case, you know you're not going to miss. And you know why? Because you have a compression punch, favorite tool of the month, right? It's a little spring-loaded metal puncher, so that when you want to drill through metal, because it, it's really hard to get a drill bit started, you just put the compression punch on the metal, like this, and watch this. Bonk. And it puts a nice little hole in the metal, or a dimple if it's thick metal, and that lets you get your drill started better. So I'm putting three of those in. Then I'm going to pre-drill, because I'm using brass screws, and brass it's really soft. It's almost as soft as copper. So now you've got the little um, holes, so it's time to drill. And it's probably a really good idea to actually put one screw in so that you don't drill all the holes and then the metal starts slipping around. So I'll do that now. And really good advice is to never use um, a cordless drill or a, a drill to put brass screws into anything because it really uh, won't go well for you. There's too much torque and it ends up stripping out the head of the brass screw. See, like that? That just happened. You should see it now. It's almost a circle because the steel is so much harder than the brass. So you have to really lean into it. There we go. Okay? So you just keep doing those little screwing motions until you're satisfied with the way that the thing is lined up. And then we'll move on to putting on the back supports, which you'll need after a lot of screwing. OK, the excitement mounts. Look, it's really coming along now, OK? It's almost ready. But we have to add some side pieces, what I call back supports, here, so that the thing is um, held out from the wall a bit. Otherwise, this part gets crushed. So they'll, they'll look like this. They'll hold it up from the wall. Um, it's a good idea to cut these pieces about an inch shorter than the f dimension of the whole frame. Uh, they just look prettier that way. And you want to inset them a little bit. Uh, the same amount on each side, like this. And the way to attach them is to actually pre-drill through here and through here. And then I'm going to use these gorgeous copper uh, nails. They're kind of great big honking boat nails. And they'll split this old wood if I don't pre-drill. You're always afraid that when you hammer the last nail, the whole thing is going to blow, but it didn't, OK? So it's a lot pretty. OK, now here's the deal. I, uh, I'm going to light it, but I, I have a couple of other surprises to show you. So I got to go find the lighter, and I'll be right back. OK, we're almost finished with our mini fireplace, our wall-mounted mini fireplace, if you will. And um, there's just a couple of things I want to mention. If you really are a beginner at these miter joints, um, especially the longer they are, you know, the harder they are to make them work all along the length of them. So you can cover them with something decorative like copper foil, which is what I'm using here. And then the way to pound, uh, to attach that to the frame is these uh, little brass escutcheon pins. They work great. Just pre-drill first, because they'll give you a fight if you don't. Um, look, this sconce thing is cool, OK? There are people that have been at this for a while. And look at the kind of thing they're doing. This is Rami Rodriguez, and she does these uh, perforated metal and paper sconces. They're gorgeous. And then this guy, actually, uh, Kevin Roach, carves and paints 
sconces, and then this is built to take a taper, uh, a taller candle. And this thing is wrought iron and hand-blown glass, and uh, this is Don Pell's work. These guys are really good. They just stuck with it. You know, they might have started with something humble like this. This is Don Pell, too, and it's got a piece of pyrite. Okay, so now I can't stand it any longer, so I'm just going to come over here and light this thing, okay? And then, oh, look at that, the warm glow. Cool, eh? Who's got marshmallows? There's something about the flickering patterns of firelight that generates original thought. Some of life's best conversations take place around a fire, and most of the world's finest literature was written by candlelight. Also, no one ever looks bad in candlelight. This can be magically romantic, or it can get you into trouble. But either way, you're going to be illuminated.